It's a great pleasure to have today uh, Evgeny Lyukumovic Ly from uh, University of Toronto, and uh, he's going to talk about foliation of three manifolds of positive scalar curvature by surfaces of control size. So thank you very much, Evgeny, for uh, agreeing to give the talk. And uh, I remind that this is a shared seminar between uh, the PD seminar and the uh, informal geometric analysis seminar. The floor is yours. Uh, Evgeny, take it over. Thank you so much, Antonio. Thank you for the invitation. This is my first time at UMT, although digitally not quite in person. Well, um, and I'm going to talk about a joint work with Davi Maximo. And um, uh, the theme of the talk today will be how curvature, more specifically positive scalar curvature, uh, what kind of geometric features it uh, determines about Riemannian manifolds. So let me very quickly give you an overview about curvature. So if you have a surface S in R3, we can pick a point and we can start intersecting uh, the surface with various planes that go through that point and contain the normal vector to the surface at that point. And we can look at how these intersections, these various curves how much they're curving and we can start uh, recording these values. And if you look at the maximal and minimal curvature, which turn out to be perpendicular to each other, then the product of the maximal and minimal curvatures here turns out to be a certain intrinsic invariant of the surface, something that only depends on the geometry of the surface itself and is known as the Gauss curvature. And so if uh, our surface looks somewhat like this, then you can see that the curves are curving the same way. And so the Gauss curvature will be positive. But if our surface is, looks like a saddle, then there will be a curve which is pointing one way like this and another curve that's just pointing the other way. And so the product of the two will be negative. And then we'll say that it's a negative, <clears throat> negatively curved manifold. So this is the situation for surfaces. And you can see that uh, curvature captures important information about geometry of the surface. But if you would like to generalize it to n-dimensional manifolds, the situation is more complicated. Uh, the kind of full information about the curvature is contained in the Riemann curvature tensor, something that you feed it with three vectors in the tangent space of your point P, and it outputs another vector. And Gromov has called this a uh, little monster of multilinear algebra, because even though it contains the description, all the description of curvature that we need is very difficult to understand. So we may sacrifice some, some of the information, but make this a little bit simpler by taking the trace. So if you have some vector x, we can consider a orthonormal basis of vectors perpendicular to x, and we can sum uh, over these uh, scalar products to obtain something which is called the Ricci curvature at the point P. And so this already has a lot of important, interesting uh, things. A lot of, it gives us a lot of interesting information if we know that this quantity is positive, as we will see in a moment. And then we can take another step and take another trace. And then we will obtain a scalar valued uh, quantity, something that just assigns a number to every point on our manifold. Here we have a function which takes in a vector 
in the tangent space and outputs a number. And here we have just a number, which is just uh, summing up the Ricci curvatures over an orthonormal basis at the point. Uh, so today we will be talking about this uh, scalar curvature quantity and we'll try to understand uh, the geometric consequences of this quantity being positive. There is one immediate interpretation that you can obtain uh, by just Taylor expanding uh, the volume of a small ball in uh, normal coordinates. You'll see that locally the scalar curvature de de uh, determines how large your uh, small tiny balls around the point are. So if you're kind of in the positive curvature situation, then tiny balls will have smaller volume than the Euclidean ball. And if you are in a negatively curved situation, then tiny balls will have slightly larger. So, so is R supposed to be epsilon? That's right. Thank you. <clears throat> But this holds uh, at a small scale, and it's not clear what's happening if we increase the sizes of the balls and what it tells us about the geometry of the manifold. And somehow, uh, all of our success in understanding scalar curvature came from somewhat indirect methods, not from looking at this particular uh, identity. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the theme will be that positive curvature implies that the manifold is small in a certain sense. And we have excellent results, classical results in this direction for Ricci curvature. We know that the Ricci curvature is positive, then we know uh, in a very precise sense uh, that the manifold is small. Particularly if you have a positive lower bound, which is <clears throat> the Ricci curve which is bounded away from zero, then we know the uh, uh, bound on the diameter of the manifold. And also if you look at our manifold M and we pick a point here and we start considering geodesic spheres around that point, then uh, their volumes and areas will be growing in a way that's not faster than the volumes and areas of uh, geodesic balls on the uh, standard round sphere of the corresponding curvature. And so we can sweep out this manifold by uh, surfaces of controlled area. So today I will focus on the question of what kind of geometric smallness can we obtain if the impose positive scalar curvature condition. So one thing that one immediately sees is that we cannot hope to get this kinds of results. So if you have a n-dimensional manifold, and let's say for now that n is greater or equal than four, if you have manifold m, then you can define uh, manifold, and then dimensional manifold, but taking a product of an n minus two dimensional manifold with a sphere of very small radius. And because you're averaging over uh, curvatures in various directions, if you pick this r sufficiently small, then your scalar curvature you can ma make positive and arbitrarily large. In particular, for example, you can take the n minus two hyperbolic space and multiply it by a, a very tiny two dimensional sphere with standard metric. And then it will have large positive scalar curvature, but it will have infinite diameter 
And if you take a point and consider geodesic spheres around that point, then the areas of the spheres and the volumes of the balls will grow exponentially. So you don't have smallness in the sense that you have it for positive Ricci curvature. And if you have a three-dimensional uh, manifold, then you can do the following construction. If you have two manifolds, M1 and M2, and there's a construction due to uh, gromov lawson and Chen Yao, where you can take a uh, connect some of those in a way that preserves the positivity of the scalar curvature. It will be still positive. So if you take any sort of graph, one dimensional graph whose bounded degree, so maybe a tree, or maybe a more complicated graph, then you can construct a Riemannian manifold with positive scalar curvature by just associating to each vertex some uh, manifold with positive scalar curvature, maybe just the sphere, S3. And then corresponding to each edge, you can perform the uh, gromov lawson connect sum. This way you will obtain a manifold and you can make the diameter as large as you like. And also it will be large in a sort of isoperimetric sense. You will not be able to cut this manifold into two pieces of approximately the same volume by some hypersurface of small area. Uh, for example, if you take uh, an expander graph, then those are very connected. And so the hypersurfaces you want to cut will have to be very large. Or if you want to construct some sweep out, uh, the areas will have to be very large. So this is this kind of uh, examples show how in what sense uh, manifolds with positive scalar curvature can be large. But they also suggest um, a certain notion of smallness, because all of these manifolds, when you look from far away, look like they're two dimensions smaller than they are, right? They look like something n minus two dimensional times something else, or maybe a tubular neighborhood of some n minus two dimensional uh, uh, polyhedral complex in some larger space. And that's precisely what Gromov conjectured that uh, they admit a map into a uh, polyhedral complex of dimension n minus two. And the fibers of that map will be small in a certain sense. So uh, in the 80s, he conjectured that they will have small diameter. More recently, he conjectured that they will have small area. And then he combined the two conjectures to make it as hard as possible to prove they have both small diameter and small area. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some progress in, in this direction in dimension three. Let me maybe pause for any questions. Uh, just a question. Uh, uh, here, when you say the, the bounds are on the wall fiber, so not so the, in principle they could uh, decompose in uh, in component in in several connected components. So the conjecture is in all. So the diameter should be bounded on all the fiber. Uh, right, right. But because we are we have freedom in in how we choose this complex. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. We no. can modify it so that it's really uh, just the connected component. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. So it's a kind of a Reeb graph construction yeah. that you can do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So, so we proved that there exists a foliation of any closed three manifold with positive scalar curvature, which has nice bounds on its area, diameter, and also its genus. And in some more specific situations, when the manifold is a three sphere or is one crosses two, then actually we have foliation by spheres. Okay, so here the theorem is stated in terms of a Morse function and connected components. 
so it's it's kind of a choice for aesthetic reasons. So it's people are more used to Morse functions, but you can also uh, formulate it as a statement about some uh, maybe different map G from M into some one dimensional graph gamma. <laughs> so this is my gamma. And then uh, we look, uh, we're looking at uh, the bounds on areas, diameters, and genus of just fibers, not the connected components of the fibers. Then you can replace the connected component with just fiber. And <clears throat> in fact, in this case, uh, you can improve this to six uh, bound the genus. And uh, um, right, so, so these bounds are not uh, sharp. The way we prove things, it's tricky to produce sharp bounds while controlling all of these three things. But if we drop one of those, if you drop the diameter, then we, it's easier to get closer to the sharp bounds here. Um, if you just think about the area, then in the case of S3, there is a Morse function whose fiber, whose uh, uh, connected components of fibers uh, have areas at most 24 pi over lambda zero. That's the area of an equator in the standard S3. So that I expect to be sharp. And uh, we get a similar bound for uh, S2 cross S1 into uh, or fibers of a map <clears throat> with 2 cross S1 into S1. And uh, more generally, we get the slightly worse bound for the areas, and we get bound uh, of genus 2, which I expect to be sharp because 2 is the uh, Higer genus of some spherical uh, uh, space forms. And so you know, when we do the fallations, we'll have to pass through those. So two has to have to be the sharp bound here. Okay. One can use this result to construct another kind of uh, singular foliation, in this case by closed curves. So we have a foliation, a singular foliation by surfaces. And then each surface you can also foliate by curves. And this way you obtain a map from M into R2 and the bounds on the areas and the genus of the surfaces translates into a bound for the length of curves in this foliations. So we have a family of nice curves, uh, short curves sweeping out our manifold. It would be really nice from here to conclude the existence of a short closed geodesic in our three manifold. But um, unfortunately, when you do the mountain pass argument on these types of things, you don't quite get a closed geodesic. Instead, you get something that's called a stationary geodesic network, which is a generalization of closed geodesic to uh, graphs. So basically you get a graph, something like that. That uh, has geodesic arcs and then the vectors at the vertices sum up to zero. So here, for example, they would have to form 120 degree angles. So it's a stationary uh, point of a mapping of a graph into the manual. Okay, so this is a this was a quick overview of results. And now I'll um, go into the proofs, but let me maybe quickly pause for any questions.
Okay, so the main technique uh, in, in the proofs is to use minimal surfaces. So it was a very important observation about scalar curvature that one of the ways to get at scalar curvature is through minimal surfaces. So ambient positive scalar curvature using stability operator gives us information about smallness of certain minimal surfaces in the manifold. Mainly, there are the following diameter bounds from the arguments of Shane Yao and also Grom of Lawson, that if you have a stable surface with boundary, so let's say you have some curve in your manifold with positive um, scalar curvature, and then you feel that curve by some minimal surface, let's say disk, and then you take any point on that disk, then the distance from that disk to the boundary will be at most to two pi of square root of ground zero. So it's going to be controlled. Actually, one can slightly improve on this. Well, this is not sharp, but uh, uh, it's good enough for us because some of the other arguments are not sharp in any case. And then from this argument, one can also conclude that if you have a closed stable minimal surface, closed stable minimal sphere, then it will have to have control diameter. And you also get the bound on an index one uh, minimal surface, because if you have some index one minimal surface, you can look at two points which are at the maximal distance, and you can go halfway between them so that both parts are kind of borderline stable. And so then you will have bounds on half, on, on the length of half the distance between these two points. So you get bounds for the diameters of index one and uh, stable surfaces. And you have bounds in the area. So this is a kind of a classical uh, bound, but uh, Marcus and Nevis proved also uh, a bound on the uh, uh, area of the index one uh, minimal sphere using some clever computation with stability operator and the Hirsch trick. So if you have index one and stable minimal surfaces, then you can control their size in a nice way. Okay. Now we'd like to go from that, from a nice control for minimal surfaces in our manifold to existence of these nice foliations. And Generally speaking, why do we even expect to have some minimal surfaces in our manifold? Well, if our surface is, if our three manifold is something like S1 cross S2, then you can imagine that we have some uh, non-trivial two spheres. And so we can minimize those two spheres in the uh, homotopy class and then we will obtain some minimal two-sphere. And so we know that it's small, okay. But it doesn't kind of tell us much about the rest of the manifold. And if we have something like S3, then, well, we don't have any reason to believe that if we minimize something, we will get any uh, minimal surface. So instead, we need to do a mountain pass construction, where instead of minimizing surface in its homotopy class, we consider a whole one parameter family of surfaces. So a sweep out of a three by two spheres. And then we somehow try to minimize them simultaneously. We we'll try to minimize the maximal area of the surface in this uh, family. And so there is a theory that deals with this problem uh, and kind of built using this intuition. It um, shows that this is possible. So it's a kind of, it's called uh, the uh, Simon Smith version of Angren Pitts Minmax theory. And in this particular setting, sorry, my daughter just woke up. 
So in this particular uh, setting, we can obtain minimal surfaces that come from the Higgard splitting. So if you have a three manifold, um, then we can decompose this manifold into two handle bodies whose boundaries are is a surface. And if you know that it's a spherical space form, then we know the three manifold topologies tell us that uh, if it's a lens space, then the handle body will be a torus. And for other ones, we will have a genus two handle body. And so we can run, we can construct a sweep out using this Higer decomposition. And um, we can construct a minimal surface and it will be index one minimal surface, which is kind of natural since it comes from a one parameter sweep out. And uh, it will be isotopic to the uh, Higer splitting of M. Right. Um, in case if it's if it's not RP three. So now, if it's RP three for M, RP three we have a dichotomy. So either it will be uh, index one torus, either we will get an index one torus, which of course we will not in uh, uh, no. That's not true. We actually do. We, we might get an index one torus, or we get an RP2 stable, minimal RP2 with stable double cover. So we'll have one of these two possibilities in case uh, of RP3. Okay. So now we have these index one surfaces and possibly some stable minimal surfaces and we want to interpolate between them. And the idea will be to use mean cur curvature flow to flow the index ones until they hit the stable minimal surfaces. So let's uh, try to understand what's happening topologically. So we know by uh, Perelman's work by classification of manifolds or three manifolds in this case of positive scalar curvature that uh, our three manifold can be decomposed into pieces one two, three and so on where each mi here so these are minimal two spheres in fact minimal stable two spheres we can cut it into pieces and each piece will be a spherical space form. Uh, then we might get S1 cross S2, but if you get S1 cross S2, we simply cut it by another stable uh, minimal sphere, or we might get uh, RP2 cross S1. That's enough. And then in each of those pieces, we can do mean max and we can obtain a kind of a stable Higert splitting, sorry, index one Higert splitting. So maybe a torus or a genus two or a sphere of that manifold. Any questions? So we can formulate this as follows. So the pieces into which to cut. I'm sorry to interrupt. I have a question. I'm probably asking at the wrong point though. Um, yes. I'm wondering about the, whether there's any issues of regularity with the minimal surfaces. I mean, are these right. like automatically smooth or? Right, so, so, so that's a very important question. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, a, um, it's, it's a very complicated uh, question results of me, a lot of work of many people. So uh, for the min max construction, Almgren in the 60s formulated a very weak notion of uh, minimal services can, that can be obtained via these methods. And then with the work of uh, 
Shane Simon, Shane Simon Yao, and then Pitts, they were able to obtain regularity in some dimensions. So in co-dimension one, we have regularity for manifold of dimension uh, less than eight. So in particular, in this situation we have. Now, starting with dimension eight and up, we will have some singular set. It will not be smooth. That's a very good question. Luckily, in dimension three, we have uh, uh, results that give us uh, smoothness of this minimal synthesis. We have curvature estimates that will guarantee smoothness. Yes, thank you for a great question. So in this particular uh, situation, we um, decompose our manifold into pieces such that one boundary component is going to be some index one surface. And then all the other boundary components are going to be minimal spheres. So this is going to be stable minimal S2s. And this is going to be index one minimal surface of genus less or equal than two. So it's index one uh, minimal surface. So the fact that it has more than index one means that there is one direction where you can push it and decrease its area. So if we push it in slightly, it's going to become mean convex. And then hopefully we start applying mean curvature flow to it. And this surface will flow. Sometimes it may disconnect into pieces. And eventually it will converge to the boundary minimal two spheres. And because we already cut a maximally disjoint collection, maximal disjoint collection of minimal two spheres, it will not encounter any uh, other minimal surfaces in this process and it will fully eat uh, the whole manifold. Now, mean curvature flow may have some singularities. And so if you want to have a sufficiently nice foliation, we will not be able to have you know, a smooth foliation. We will have to have some singularities. But for example, we want only Morse type singularities. We want only have finitely many uh, singularities which are of Morse type. Then we need do, to do some extra work, but luckily not that much because mean curvature flow is very well understood. So there are words of Brendel and Heisken and Hasselhofer Klein, Hasselhofer Petober, and Buzan and Hasselhofer and Hershkowitz, which um, describe mean curvature flow with surgeries. And so they give a very detailed description of how singularities happen and one, how one can cut them away and how those regions where you cut them away look like. And basically the idea is that you will have some regions where your surface will become very close to a cylinder and then eventually it will pinch off, but right before it pinches off, you can zoom in onto this region and uh, in, the, in the region where the singularities has to happen, really the tropopolis actually want to zoom in on this region. So right before the singularity has to happen, we can map it into R3 uh, by some one plus epsilon by Lipschitz map. And we will see something very close to the standard round cylinder. And then we can basically by hand describe that if you have something very close to standard round cylinder, then you can cut this away and you can construct 
a family of surfaces was exactly one uh, singular point of foliation in here. In the process, we may lose the correct sign of the mean curvature here. We may slightly increase areas or diameters, but because it happens, it's happening on a very small scale, whatever we lose will be really tiny. And so basically the description that uh, they give about mean curvature flow with surgery lets us take any problematic region where the singularities has to happen, zoom in, see a nice Euclidean picture, cut it, uh, decompose it, and then restart the flow. And then we know from their estimates that the flow will have to run at least for some time before it happens again. So we only have to do it finitely many times. So basically, we end up with a proposition that there exists a more foliation of a geometrically prime region that starts at an index one minimal surface and that ends up with a bunch of stable minimal spheres. And the areas will be smaller than the area of the original index one uh, minimal surface. That pretty much proves the result. Then we need just to put all of this together and then we'll have a foliation of the so just, just, just a question. So just for me to see, and if I understood. So you you first decompose and you get these boundary curves. Uh, um, uh, then with the mean curvature flow, you have a propagation of the area bound. So is the but I'm a bit confused on the bound on the on the genus and on the. Uh, so they get propagated as well with the mean curvature flow or you need to- So the bound on the genus does get propagated because the mean curvature flow, if you have a surface you know, with some genus, what can happen? You, you, you may get uh, something pinched off, right? So you may lose some genus here, but you will not gain, no genus will appear, no handles will appear during the mean curvature flow. Okay. So the genus can only go down, but the diameter bound you lose. You cannot say anything about the diameter. And that's what I'm about to say next. Ah, okay. You need to treat after the, okay, okay, sorry. Right. So this procedure gives us nice bounds for the area and the genus. Now, what about the diameter? So that's indeed an excellent question. How, how do we get the bound on the diameter? So let us now go back to uh, an argument of Grom Lawson in the 80s that gives the bound on the diameter for foliation for uh, uh, foliations of uh, simply connected or homology zero uh, first or, or manifolds with zero first homology. picture. So the argument is, is really nice, but it is slightly technical, but I still want to kind of uh, give you the description of this argument. So let's pick a point P and let's uh, consider geodesic spheres around that point. some point, these geodesic spheres may have more than one connected component. So Gromov claims that each connected component of the geodesic sphere will have diameter at most 12 pi or square root of lambda zero. So let's, for simplicity, take the scale of curvature equal to one. We want to claim that the connected component will have a diameter at most 12 pi. And by diameter, I mean the extrinsic diameter. And this is also actually in, in our theorem. The diameter that we have is the diameter in the ambient metric, not in the intrinsic diameter of the, of the surface. So let's, um, let's use a different color. Let us pick two points X and Y. Let's assume that they're at the maximal distance from each other. So the distance between is equal to the diameter. And let's consider a minimizing geodesics connecting these two points. 
Now, we may assume that the distance between P and X and Y is large, because if it's, say, less, if it's less than 6 pi, then obviously the diameter is less than 12 pi. So let's say that the distance here, um, the distance here, let's say, is some distance L greater than 6 pi. And let's go back a little bit and consider a geodesic sphere oh, that's at the distance L minus 2 pi plus epsilon. So we consider geodesic sphere a little bit uh, closer to P. Now, okay, so that, uh, so now uh, we do the following. So we can connect y and x inside of the level set because they're in the same connected component. So we can connect it inside the geodesic sphere. And we obtain a closed curve, a triangle here. And we can fill that triangle with the minimal surface. If the manifold is simply connected, we can contract the curves, in particular the existed disk. We can minimize among all disks with that boundary. And so we obtain a minimal surface. Now, this minimal surface will intersect this level set. Let me call that level set. So this is going to be boundary of B L minus two pi minus epsilon. It will intersect um, that geodesic sphere in a bunch of curves. Some of them may be circles, but there will be a curve which connects these two endpoints. And because it's a disk, there will have to be uh, an intersection with this boundary point, with this boundary point. We cannot have anything like that because th those are different distances. So there has to be a uh, a curve connecting these two points, which is the intersection of this geodesic with this boundary sphere and that geodesic with that boundary sphere. Let's give these two points names y1 and x1. And the claim is that these two points, y1 and x1, are actually close to each other. <clears throat> so let's pick a point on the curve in between that is halfway between uh, this, so that this, let me call this gamma x, call this gamma y. So we pick a point, uh, let's call it q, which is halfway between gamma x and gamma y. So the same distance between gamma x and gamma y. We know by the estimate for, uh, minimal surfaces that this point Q has to lie close to the boundary of this disk. So if we draw a, a minimizing geodesic to the boundary, notice that this minimizing geodesic to the boundary has to go to either gamma Y or gamma X. It cannot go to this curve because this curve is, a, is at the distance to pi plus epsilon. And this point has to lie at the distance to pi. And because it's the same distance from gamma x and gamma y, there will be uh, another geodesic of the same length that goes to the other curve. OK, this way we obtain yet two more uh, points, y2 and x2. Okay, so this is now getting confusing. So that one was x1, this is x2. Okay, so now let's look at some inequalities. So we have that from P to Y2 plus the distance from Y2 to Q by triangle inequality is greater or equal than the distance from P to Q. 
the distance from P to Q is exactly L minus two pi minus epsilon. And we know that the distance from Y2 to Q is at most uh, two pi. This is less or equal to two pi. So we get that PY2 is greater or equal to L minus two pi minus epsilon minus Y to Q. So that's greater or equal than L minus four pi minus epsilon. Okay. So the distance from here, from here to here is greater or equal than uh, L minus two, four pi minus epsilon, which means that the distance from Y2 to Y1 implies that the distance from y2 to y1 has to be less or equal than uh, 2 pi, right? Because y1 lies exactly at the distance 2 pi plus epsilon from y. So this gives us a bound on the size of this, this arc. And well, that means that the distance from y to q, which is bounded to by the distance from y to y1 plus y1 to y2 plus uh, y2 to q, can now bound that. Uh, so this one is two pi plus epsilon. This one is at most two pi, and this one is at most two pi, and we get uh, six pi plus epsilon. The same we get for x, for the distance from x to q is at most six pi plus epsilon. So we conclude that the distance between y and x is less or equal than 12 pi plus two epsilon, but the epsilon was arbitrary. So we get that the distance between y and x is at most 12 pi. So this is a really nice argument that tells you that this in radius bound for this disk somehow gives you a bound between these two on the distance between these two points. So this was slightly technical, but feel free to ask questions. One can sort of uh, remember the, the main idea of the argument by, by saying that if you have a, a disk and you know that every point is close to the boundary, and then you somehow decompose it into the boundary into four parts, and these two parts are sort of far from each other, then these two parts have to be close to each other. That's essentially what's, what's in, that, in that argument. So we want to imitate the same kind of argument, and, um, but in a somewhat more general setting, now we measure distance not from a point, but from a surface, but this surface has control diameter. And we are looking not at um, level sets of uh, the distance function, not just the geodesic spheres, but surfaces which are constrained, which are trapped between two geodesic spheres of comparable diameter. So if you have some surface here, and it is trapped between two geodesic spheres and it's connected. Actually, it's a statement not even about the surface, it's a statement about the connected component of your manifold trapped between two geodesic spheres of, uh, of um, at the distance 
which is different by 10 pi over square root of lambda zero, then by, very, by pretty much the same argument, we get the bound on the diameter of this surface. So this is our surfaces. So you can relax this argument to saying that if you are like this, and this is your geometrically prime region, and your boundary here has control diameter, then if you're trapped between two uh, geodesic spheres and you're connected, then you have to have small diameter. So the rest of the argument now works out like this. We start with the index one surface, and then we start flowing it by mean curvature flow. In the process of flowing it, the diameter may, may get distorted, and also it may become long. Its distance to uh, distance to our original surface sigma may become large. And then whenever this happens, whenever the distance, uh, the difference between distances of the closest point to sigma and the furthest point from sigma become large, whenever it kind of stretches in space uh, and reaches that threshold of how much it is allowed to stretch in space, we cut it. We consider a, a geodesic sphere, which cuts it halfway between these two points, which are furthest and further and furthest away. So, so this is now a surface S. It's a two-dimensional surface. We intersect it with a two-dimensional surface. We obtain a bunch of curves, one-dimensional curves, and then we feel those curves in the isotopy class of one of the two halves. Okay, I did it the wrong way. That's exactly what we're not doing because this region we already swept out. Go back. So we are minimizing it that direction. So, so the part to the left is what we already swept out here. And we are minimizing it to the inside, to the part that we haven't swept out yet. And so we have good diameter bounds but for this feeling by the uh, diameter bound estimate for minimal surfaces. And then we cut the surface into two parts. It's this color now to obtain here is surface to one side and another surface to the other side. So these, this is a minimal uh, surface. This is a, the original surface is a mean convex surface. And then we have a corner. When we smooth out that corner, we obtain a mean convex surface. And so we can restart the mean, the mean curvature flow and we can restart the mean curvature flow here. And this way we shorten the distance, we shorten the difference between distances to sigma of different points. And therefore we put the diameter under control until again it drifts off and then we cut again. So now the, when we have to, when we do this procedure, we have to keep control of both area and the genus. And this is where we have to, we start, need to make some difficult choices because, so suppose this is, this is our situation. Maybe we have the genus all on one side and most of the area is on the other side. And we now want to cut and decompose it into two surfaces. So when we cut, we have two choices. Either we can, either we, dec if we uh, minimize in the isotopy class of this, or we minimize in the isotopy class of the other part. 
And then we, whatever choice we make, then if you make the first choice, then we will end up with the surface here after we cut it into two pieces, we will end up with the surface of genus four, we'll double the genus. And if we end up, if we make the, cho the, the and, and here we will end up with a nice surface of uh, genus two. But if we do the other choice, then uh, we will end up with a, surface of controlled area on one side, but on the other side, maybe when you minimize here, the area doesn't go down at all, or just by a little bit, and then you effectively double the area of your right, right side. So when you make this choice, you either have to sacrifice the genus or have to sacrifice the area. But the observation is that there is an asymmetry in terms of these two regions. There is one region on the left side, which after we resume the mean curvature flow will remain trapped. You see this, uh, this region is squeezed between two minimal surfaces. And so as we flow it, it will remain uh, uh, squeezed between two geodesic spheres of comparable distance. And so we will not need to perform this cutting procedure on it ever again. But this one will move to the uh, right and potentially maybe will become very long and we will need to cut it again and again and again and we don't know how many times we need to do it. So we always know how to make this choice so that the thing on the right has both area and genus controlled, while the thing on the left may double its area or may double its genus, but we will only need to do it one time, and so uh, we, don't, we don't need to worry about it. So that's why we have sort of an increase in, in area and genus bounds in our final uh, result. Okay. Let me finish here. So thank you very much, Yip, for uh, very beautiful talk. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, there are also virtual applauses. So are there uh, any questions from the audience for Yip Yeni? So meanwhile, I had a question, um, and it's, this is related to a comment that you made along the way. Um, so you were mentioning that this is the uh, extrinsic diameter, right? But in principle, when you are building, I don't know if I'm getting the right uh, intuition about it, but when you are building this, uh, this foliation, so the issue is that these, uh, these fibers may oscillate a lot, and this would uh, uh, give you a problem in controlling the intrinsic diameter, right? So there is no way to try to control the, the oscillation on the on the foliation. Let's say I'm imagining really a sort of adding to the process also a sort of pull tight procedure where you try to straight you try to straighten up. So if you try to run a pull tight procedure along the way, now I don't know exactly which point, uh, and you try to straighten up these fibers. At the end, the two things, the extrinsic and intrinsic diameter may become comparable. So I, this is what I was wondering. So have you, have you tried this or? Uh, so do you think it, it, may, be, it may hold or? Uh... I think that's a, that's a great question. I, I guess uh, we conjecture that uh, the result should hold with intrinsic diameter. For the minimal surfaces, both index one and stable, we have bounds for intrinsic diameter. And, but when we start doing mean curvature flow and this argument with comparison, romov lothan argument, we lose that. And uh, it would be nice, uh, one of, and it would have some interesting applications. I, I think it, it will be helpful for obtaining uh, a short closed geodesic, for example. And so with this methods, we only obtain stationary, short stationary geodesic network. But if you have a bound on the intrinsic diameter, then I think one would be able to obtain the short closed geodesic. Mm -hmm. And but uh, pulling tight, I think it's a nice idea. It's it's not immediately clear to me how to make it work, but uh, I think that it, it should be possible. I see. I see. 
Thank you. Thank you. Out, out. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, are there any questions for Yevgeny? Okay, so if not, let's thank you again, again for the. Thank video. you. And thank uh, you. Yes, so uh, again, if you want, we can chat a bit more. Uh, let sure. me uh, stop the recording just a